a lot of responses about Rusty. And I just said, I just had a note I gave, I said, sent to a fellow. You know, I don't know any of you. I don't trust you enough to say, tell me the truth. Hang on, I'm going to make a cup of coffee and tell you more. Uh, the, the, first, the first thing that I want to explain is circumstance. Uh, I'm not the norm. I am a completely different animal. I don't sleep. I didn't sleep. Uh, and all I did then was network. All I did was work on guitars and talk to... My entire life was immersed in the business. And that meant that not just because some of them were famous, I lived in a town in a time when fucking everybody was signed. We had the, I had the drummer for the Outlaws and Henry Paul uh, living within about an eighth of a mile. Uh, Huey Thomason up the street. Uh, and then I find out that I'm living in a property that was owned by Dickie Betts and uh, co-owned by Kenny G's dad. Oh, all this is happening. Uh, it, when I go to rehearse at a rehearsal hall, Buffett's in there rehearsing, uh, or Ronstadt's in there rehearsing, or Dan Fogelberg, or Hank Jr., and so they all want some bumps. So I get the order, and I go over to Rusty's and get the bump and take it back, and then they say, come back hang out, we do the after party, and then do I want to hang around and maybe take part? So guys like me end up in recording sessions in places where normal people fear to tread. No, I came on as a social guy in the middle of a circle that was uh, open, and we had Allman Brothers, uh, Sea Level, uh, guys in UFO, uh, Savoy Brown members, uh, uh, Grinder Switch, The Allman Brothers, Wet Willie, The Outlaws, uh, 38 Special, and Molly Hatchet, and that was just my friend. Come on, Chloe. He's named after you. Know. So, I was living in a time that was different, you know. I, I blew into town with Fred Lloyd after uh, doing stuff out of the area with the nice laugh. Had friends in the business, so St. Petersburg around 1976 and 77, I start working with Rusty. Fred and I going to a concert to see uh, Leslie West. Rusty was opening the show. Boom. Hey, man, how you doing? Haven't seen you. Da, 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 da. Here's my phone number. Can you get rid of any weed? Yeah, probably. Okay. Boom, bing, bang. So now, you know, the guy that hasn't seen him in a few years is coming up to his house fairly regularly between 76, 77. And then 77, I was permanently assigned what he considered sound manager and biographer biographist biographist he said uh, I was the world's foremost knowledgeable individual on cactus he said a poindexter that knows a lot about me in other words <laughs> and I didn't have a, a nickname yet so he took care of that I don't know it has nothing to do with the size of my pecker it means that I the whole world is my home but it's true Okay, so back to Rusty. So we're going back and forth, and all this shit's happening. We do these uh, these tours, and, and, and what we're dealing gets more and more complicated and bigger and bigger and bigger until one day I find out we got a bodyguard. <clears throat> and I never met him. Uh, six weeks later, the bodyguard and my guitar player came to murder him. Come on, Letty! Came to murder me. For my money and Rusty for his money. Woody's blind, by the way. He's he's 100 blind. I trained him with the uh, music and my voice. Okay, so we're dealing. Band's playing. Tour bus is out front. Things are going pretty fucking good. And then Rusty gets this idea that he wants to do this big deal and go to Detroit and be the Detroit connection. A town that he escaped from in a shot out car that a lot of people don't know. That's why Rusty moved. <laughs> Told me about that one night real late, you know, and yeah, I didn't think too much of it. I thought it was a one time thing. Okay? So we decided to get a bigger thing. 25 keys. You know, so everybody's kicking in all over our little circle. Six weeks before the deal, this is Easter Sunday, uh, Ron Sanders loaned Rusty Day $32,000 because he wanted to know where the money was and 
where a large uh, opportunity was, as it turns out. And his bodyguard and his uh, sort of a flunky that was thrown out of a couple of mob circles, a hitman named Al, real unsteady guy that scared the fuck out of me. I literally had to be taken from the house and somewhere else because I was ready to have a goddamn nervous breakdown. I thought somebody was going to kill me. And I was right. I just didn't know it. Uh, so anyway, Rusty bar, uh, borrows 32 grand. Uh, he's supposed to pay him back in six days or five days. Uh, it ends up going all the way till June. Okay, so right at the end of June, we got signed. Me and five other guys and Rusty got signed. We're going to do this record. And so, of course, we integrate the guy with the local studio, Ron Sanders, because now we got the studio, the demo, transportation point for all the bump we're doing. Came to town. That picture is of the, when I uh, was just uh, sort of reporting for the week for the work, you know. So came, I found they'd be up all night, so I went to the studio. I worked at the studio uh, Monday into Tuesday. Uh, that's the first of June, and um, came back that night. This is the most important part of all the story, and this is exactly how the police can solve this crime. At the house at 173 Parsons Road, I sat at the dinner table uh, several hours that night cutting the money bands that went on $267,500 and then $12,000 and then $2,000. It was coming in last second and it was getting put on the money by me and Jocko. And um, money was put away and ready to do the deal. Dinner time comes, I go to Chuck E. Cheese's Take Jocko to Chuck E. Cheese's. Garth McRae comes into uh, the airport. Pick him up on the way back, bring him to the house. Phone rings, about 9.30. Ron Sanders. Russ is in the back. Russ says, I'll call him later. Okay, a few minutes later, phone rings and it's Armando, the dealer. He isn't going to make it uh, so early. He's on his way. He hasn't got there from Miami yet with tequila. Boom, a few minutes later, Ron Sanders. Boom. A few minutes later, a girl in, in Clearwater, my daughter's mom, whose name I'm not going to enter into this because she's psycho anyway. They know who she is. <laughs> no telling how bad she hates me now. No, you can tase my ass and those lips will never say it. I think my ass would start a combustible propane fire that would end up blowing my head off by the time I got all of her name out. Anyway, uh, that's what I think and I'm sticking to it. So anyway, uh, she calls. 10, 10, 15, a particular call came in. Rusty said, I'll take it in the back. He goes to the back. He's back there arguing. A few minutes later, he comes out singing Dirty Deep Thunder Cheap, the last song he sang in the world. Uh, he says, God damn it, if my lawyers have to go after hers and hers come after me, and he said, fuck, we'll settle this shit this way. And then he came into the table, did a blast. We arm wrestled. We talked, did a bunch of bullshit. The phone rang. Now it's midnight-ish. It's the fucking girl again, asking now if I can take her to work the next day in Clearwater. And that made me out of to stay all night. So I'm thinking, when's the shit going to get here? It's now 1 a.m. When's the shit going to get here? I don't know. So we're all in the house. Uh, Jocko and I had some interplay, and I carried him around, did the rough-necking shit that I always did with him. And then that phone rang one more time and said, are you coming or not? And I looked at Rusty and said, I think I'm going to go to Clearwater. Can you get me, a, can you chop me out a quarter ounce? And me and another guy, Jim Zebo Hughes. Jim Hughes lived in Clearwater and he owned a fencing company. Said, I'll roll you back in my pickup truck to Clearwater. So Jim and I in the front, uh, front yard, Zebo, his name is Zebo. Jim Hughes, but his nickname is Zebo. We got in the truck, it was a Ford pickup. Rusty came out and hugged me and thanked me for all the effort to help with interaction with the family. And he said, fuck, it's just fantastic that you're here. I'll see you back, what, tomorrow? And I go, yeah, I'll take the check, and then I'll wake up and come back up. Me and Zebo drive to Clearwater. Noon the next day. No, closer to 6 o'clock the next day, Fred Lloyd called me from Colorado Springs and said, you're alive. And I said, what do you mean? He said, have you been to Rusty's? And I said, yeah, I came back last night to, to bang a girl. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I don't, I, you know, it's just another day. And he says, 
brother, you should sit down right now, okay? Because I got some bad news for you. And so I did. I sat down and he told me that uh, I was on the news, that I had been murdered. And Rusty and another kid. And so uh, I remember saying to him that the uh, rumors of my untimely demise are definitely greatly exaggerated. Explain what they said. <laughs> thought he was joking. You know, I thought it was, you know, I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a real joke. And, uh, and um, so I quote something from, from Bill Colts, right, because I thought he was joking. And then he proceeds to just simply turn up the television as it, or radio, whatever was it, playing, and it said, Grizzly murder of three, uh, Montgomery Charles Thomas, and, and, uh, and another individual unidentified. And um, talked to him for a minute and hung up the phone. That was Fred Lloyd, Fred L. Lloyd in uh, Scottsdale and uh, Flagstaff, Arizona today. Um, so then what I did is I, I went to my job two blocks away. It was the percussion company, and they were hip, hippies like me. John Osgood, my roommate. Uh, John Stannard, the owner of Home Percussion, and I, uh, while well, I called... Uh, the house in Longwood, and uh, the guy answered the phone, and he said, who's this? And I said, well, I think it's the last guy out the door that didn't kill my friends. And he said, who is this? And I said, Mondo, and he goes, where are you? And I said, I'm in Clearwater, come talk to me. And he goes, are you willing to discuss this? And I said, yeah, my career as a drug dealer is over, and probably my career in the music business is pretty good, done too. So from now on, I'm with you. And he said, I'll be there in two hours. And he was there in an hour and eight minutes. And this is verifiable. John Stannard, G.W. Stannard, Clearwater, Florida. He lived on Mellenbacher then. He has G.W. Stannard Corporation bells and chimes. We had own percussion, John uh, Osgood, my roommate, and I. John had been up there two nights before with me, by the way. Uh, and they sent down two investigators. One's name was Charles Brown. We called him Charlie Brown. And he had a friend that was thinner. They had suspenders. They had the guns upside down, the cigarettes. And we went in the drum booth. At the factory where we played drums and uh, did an interview in there. That's all I can say till now. Cheers. <laughs>